Greetings. I hope and trust. I find you all, my dear friends, and welcome to the sixth installment of Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And our subtopic for today is laying up treasures in heaven. Laying up treasures in heaven. Why don't we spend a brief moment together in prayer? Let us pray. Kind of gracious Father in the heavens above, dear Lord, we seek to understand how we can reap the best returns from this deal. And dear Lord, give us the advice that is suitable for our life on earth and even for the life to come. This has been our prayer of faith. In Jesus' name, we pray and we ask, Amen. Dear friends, I wish to invite you to the book of Mark. We are at chapter 8 and we'll look at verse 36 and verse 37. It provides as follows in the New King James Version. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, as Mark writes, Mark is believed to have been um, one of those disciples who got the gospel message from Peter. He's John Mark, by the way. Mark is his surname. So as John Mark writes, to distinguish him from John the Revelator, as he writes, he raises these two questions that... Um, investment questions. The first one speaks to profit and the second to trade off. Now, let us just break this a bit. Profit is that which you realize after having invested a principal amount. So that which you realize becomes in business term, the return or investment. Or it's also referred to as ROI, R-O-I, return on investment. So the return on investment is basically a financial calculation that is done by your investors. They basically express the profitability of an investment in percentage format. And how do they arrive at this? They'll say the principal, what has it grown by? That's the profit. So you invest $100, you get $150. For us to know what the rate of return is, the return on investment, we're simply going to say 150 minus the 100, which was the principal you invested. You're going to remain with 50. Divided by the principal, 50 divided by 100, you're going to get 50%. So then you're going to be told your ROI is at 50%. That sounds like a good deal. It's a good offer. So the question that is being asked goes beyond ROI. How so? Because the text says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. So what is the benefit of a profit that has no honor? Because profit is property. Profit is money. But now to have money that has no honor, there's a Latin term for property that has been vacated off. It is bona vacatia. So what it simply means is when you go by the seaside, this was the terminology, and you know there's property that washes on the sea having um, come from a, a ship that has, um, uh, you, you, you know, been sunk. When you pick up that property, it's born a vacation. No one can say, this is my property. So the Bible is raising this question. What will it profit you to have a profit that when it arrives, it has no honor? There is no one to claim it. There is no one to say it is mine. Secondly, here is the other issue. Or, alternatively, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, in business language, there is what is known as the trade-off. What you offer in exchange for what you benefit. That is what you're trading off for the benefit. Now, the, the, the issue is your soul has a price tag that is beyond your reach. You cannot transact over it for, for, for the simple reason, because you didn't bring it to be. It, it's your soul, but... Not your soul, really, because it's God who breathes into the life of man and man becomes a living soul. And this is an exercise that has been going on from time immemorial. The soul is sustained and continues to be because God has given it life. Colossians says things continue to be because he causes them to remain in their course, in their course. So as we're looking at this study, I want to say... How then do we lay these treasures in heaven? How do we lay these treasures in heaven? 
We are not the first down this path. There are some who have gone ahead of us. There are certain characters that we're going to look at. And the thrust at the end of the day is that as per Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we did look at this um, in the beginning and second lesson of this quarter, where Christ asked this question. Um, it, it's it's um, sort of a call to say you need to lay up your treasures in heaven where they will neither gather rust nor moth, where there is no thief, thief that can go in there and steal. So the question that Christ is putting to us is, where are our treasures stored? Are they stored where they can be unattended? Are they stored where they can become a stolen property and we cannot trace them anymore? And the challenge that he brings across is that trust me with these treasures. When you trust me with these treasures, they are secure. And this then puts him in, in, in a platform of what we would generally refer to as your investment portfolio manager. What an investment portfolio manager does, in brief, he or she drafts what is known as an IPS, an investment policy statement. An investment policy statement, statement will basically give you your investment options. You have investment one, two, three, and four, and you are going to benefit when you go into this one, that one, and thereafter into this one. You're going to benefit if you let go of this chip and you acquire that chip. You're going to benefit if you invest in that market instead of this market. Now, let us look at how these things would have turned out amongst the characters that we're going to look at. How did they acquire certain chips? How did they let go of certain chips from an investment perspective? And the first one we're going to look at is Noah. Noah, in the book of Genesis, Noah lives in the antediluvian period. This is the time when people um, have become uh, so evil continually that their thoughts are evil. And the Bible says it repented God that he had created man. And he thought, you know, let me just press the refresh button, F5, and start all over again. And what does God do? He then floods the whole earth. But before he does that, the Bible says Noah found grace in the sight of God. Now God says to Noah, come over. You're living amongst these people. You are set. All is well. You already have a skill, Noah. You are a carpenter. I'm not calling you to build a house. I'm calling you to build an ark. And while you're building this ark, I want you to go on and tell people about this. Go into marketing. Market this ark. Get people to come into it. When they come in, they are going to be saved from a catastrophe that is coming. What is this catastrophe? There's going to be rain. And by then, these people had never seen rain. They didn't even appreciate what it was. So Noah tells them, if you don't get into this ark, you're going to die. And Noah becomes this marketing person for 120 years. But what is the biblical term? Noah becomes an evangelist. He assumes a new profession. So when we are making an investment in heaven, what will it take? It will take you and I going into Matthew 28, where the imperative is go ye therefore. And the call is not to go to many other places. You are to start in Jerusalem and in Judea. Noah is starting with the antediluvians. These are his neighbors. These are his relatives. These are his friends. These are his colleagues. Go to those ones. So if we are to lay up a treasure in heaven, let's not think of going to heaven. We are to start in our immediate environment. When we go into that evangelistic mission, we are already setting up a treasure in heaven. We find grace when we do so. One songwriter that I love says, if you cannot preach like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say, he died for all. And this you are to tell to those who are next to you. Like Noah, that is how you invest in this portfolio. The second character that we're going to look at is Abraham. You know, Abraham is another interesting character. We find Abraham leaving his homeland, Mesopotamia an advanced economy, a flourishing economy, and he is being called to become a pilgrim. 
to reside in a tent. And the reason why there is particular reference to him residing in a tent, it is to draw the juxtaposition that the man was not a tent dweller before then. He used to reside in a house. They had libraries. It was a flourishing economy that he was in. So when he is told, come, I will show you the land when you get there. Come, I will lead you to that place. So this is a scenario where um, Abraham is being led to an unknown place and he moves by faith. Not only does he move by faith, he also trades off his vital position of influence. And God begins to bless him as he goes. Of course, you're going to have scenarios where famine strikes and he has to emigrate to Egypt and eventually comes back. But it is only as um, Lot has been taken away that you realize that Abraham was no ordinary man. He was not a rich man. He was a wealthy man. Why do I say he was a wealthy man? Before he meets Melchizedek and pays and returns the tithe, he actually mobilizes his own army, about 300 soldiers. Now, if you were to look at um, a small to medium enterprise, you're looking at a, a company that has 250 to 300 employees. So Abraham is already operating above a medium enterprise. So he mobilizes an army of his own to go and reclaim Lot. When he comes back with Lot, you're going to notice that this is no ordinary man. Now, later on, this one is the one that I found very interesting. Isaac has been born and he is suckling and he's being weaned. When Isaac is being weaned, he throws a party, slaughters beasts. He was a man who spared no expenses. Most of us, we had to wait for a 21st birthday and maybe even when it came, nothing was slaughtered. Maybe save a chicken. But as for Abraham, he is this man who has come all the way, but remains a tent dweller. What is happening with Abraham? He is a vehicle that is transporting faith from Mesopotamia to Canaan. So that as he goes there, he is going there as a missionary. So some of us, as we are making this investment, what it shall mean is for us to leave our places of abode, leave our places of origin, leave our relations, leave our comfort zones, and go and become missionaries of the word to those who have not received it, to those who may have turned away from the Lord like the Canaanites because they had an equal opportunity as descendants of Noah to receive the same gospel, but they had slighted it. So Abraham is going to Canaan to plant a new mission where this word is going to flourish. So when he gets there, appreciate this, he is one man who continues to walk by faith. He seems to be losing more than what he has, but ultimately he gains a lot more. How does he gain more? In the spiritual sense that your children shall be as many as the sands of the seashore, as many as the stars of the skies. And he's a survivor. He's going to be survived by the Messiah. The Messiah comes from the lineage of Abraham. And besides the spiritual aspect, God also blesses him in the literal and immediate sense. So when we go on and inverse and lay our treasures in heaven, there are returns that we realize even now. You know, investments have a dividend that pay in the long term, but you can also claim and get returns in the short term. So the case of Abraham is a case of God even giving in the short term. We do not just invest in the future. We even return, get the returns now. Now, move on, move on. What is Abraham doing? He's en route to an unknown place with his father who dies along the way. There's a young man. His name is Lot, his nephew. While they're there, God begins to bless Abraham. Bless him tremendously with livestock because he's basically 
someone who's into agrarian work. And as a rearer of livestock, what happens is his nephew also begins to be blessed. And he gets so much livestock that the two of them cannot have their livestock in the same place. And because of this, strife begins to arise within their heads, their headsmen. The issue is not so much the strife that I want to stress. The issue is when God begins to bless you, it follows that those who are around you must also be blessed. Why should you be the only one who gets blessed when there is a lot next to you? I'm speaking to someone who is getting a lot of money, but you have nephews and nieces that are not at school. Surely, if you are to lay up treasures in heaven, it follows that you bless those who approximate to you. They must receive that blessing. And even as they receive these blessings, notice something. Thereafter, Abraham calls the young man and says, you know, young man, we cannot live like this. We need to create space between us because we have a lot more that we have acquired in terms of assets as they do their inventory. Ultimately, he says, now we need to go our separate ways. Listen to what happens. Lord says, I'm going to go towards Sodom. As he moves towards Sodom, notice that custom would have had, had it that he would, should have deferred to Abraham to choose first. But Lord chooses first. Secondly, Lord chooses first fertile land, ahead of Abraham, from whom he has benefited in terms of blessings. What does this bad decision show us as we start off? Lot is looking at fertile land. He's looking at the concrete. He's looking at the tangible land. Abraham is looking at the intangible, the relationship that he has with his nephew. He has brought him this far. He wants to see him you know, thrive and flourish. But he would rather save the relationship. As far as Lot is concerned, the relationship is neither here nor there. The respect and the cordiality we can dispense with. He dispenses with all that. And where does he land? In Sodom. When you get to Genesis chapter 19, you know, Abraham continues to think about Lot. When the angels and the Lord have come down, he continues to negotiate. As we looked at last week's study, he continues to negotiate and grace continues to be availed as long as he is negotiating. And some of us, we stop negotiating with God and we're saying God is not answering our prayers. Negotiate with him in the moment of prayer. Now, when the time comes when Lord has to be salvaged, he's coming out of Sodom. And when he leaves Sodom, his only assets that he's valued and survived by his wife, and two daughters. The four of them make it out of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, when we make the bad, I mean bad decisions in terms of investment, we are moving away from a place where God has direct contact with us towards a place where God has less of an influence, a lifestyle that is far from God, even if we may still be committed to our faith, we put our place ourselves in a place of risk. And when we do so, what do we lose on? We may lose on our heavenly investment. But even if we may not lose in our heavenly investment, we'll definitely lose in the short term. And Lot lost everything. He came back with nothing. And in the process, even lost his wife. And the Bible says, remember Lord's wife. That's how he came back with nothing. Fast forward. You're going to find uh, Lord's grandson. Because Lord was cousins with um, Isaac. They basically shared a father. <laughs> you know, even though he was sort of like a stepson to, to Abraham. You know, Jacob is seeking after the benefit of the birthright. As he's going for the birthright, his mother gives him this idea. I, I almost say brilliant idea. His mother gives him this obnoxious idea. 
And what was this idea? Go and claim the birthright ahead of your brother. Of course, he, he may argue that he had procured the birthright in exchange for soup. But now he is the birthright. He has it. And his brother is livid, besides himself with anger, irate. He wants to tear him down to pieces with his own teeth. And the mother says, you know what, now run off to your uncle Laban. Until your brother cools off, then you will come back. And Jacob was gone for a good 20 years. Another bad decision. Why? Because he sought to access that which is divine and spiritual by his own power and his own might. And in pursuance of this, what did he achieve? He suffers relations with his brother. Secondly, he never sees his mother again. By the time he comes back, he shall come back only to bury his father. He never sees his mother again. And when we look at some of these issues, we're thinking, you know, what does it matter? A win is a win anyhow. At times, what we're learning is when we are laying up treasures in heaven, it is not about winning at times. You know, he goes for 20 years, labors for 14 years to get two women who come back with gods <laughs> that he has to dispose of by Shechem and only to meet God on his way back. <laughs> on his way back, that's when he meets God and eventually has a name change. And, and the message to us is we don't need 20 years for God to get us where we ought to be. Just one meeting with him is all that we need. When we're looking at making an investment for life, when we seek to procure it in our own strength, in our own might, in, in our own shenanigan kind of approach, it will cost us more, it will leave us with a lot of pain, and most likely we may come back with much, but having no reunion to come to. He comes back, of course, a rich man. And, of course, we cannot just gloss over this. The point that we must get and stress from this is that, you know, God still blesses us in spite of where we take ourselves to. That's grace. You know, grace will look for us, clean us up, and bring us back home. That, that's the essence of grace, in essence. But it, it doesn't mean that when we make poor choices, we are still going to walk away without consequences. We are better off not making those decisions in spite of grace that follows us. It is amazing, this grace. It is marvelous, this grace. But we are better off investing and laying treasures in heaven. Be the one who treasures even relations. Like Abraham. Abraham continues to negotiate for his nephew. He doesn't say serves him right. He thought he was too wise, too clever. No, Abraham doesn't do that. Abraham negotiates, negotiates for his nephew. And when Jacob comes back, what does he do? He says, you know, of this property that I have, that I have amassed, he gives even gifts to his brother Esau to mend relations. You know, we cannot be thinking about marching to Zion and, and going to heaven and we forget. We forget that we need to fix relations with our brothers, with our nephews. That is how we make an investment for the kingdom to come. It is here. Here. The last character we're going to look at, you know, as we wrap up, is Moses. Moses is one character that um, when we find in the book of Exodus, he is uh, picked up from um, the river. That is what Moses means. I took him out of the water. Now, Moses is taken into the house of Pharaoh, becomes sort of a step um, son to the princess, and he's en route to royalty. He is set for life. And Moses, when he is of age, does not choose to align himself with royalty. He chooses instead to align himself with slaves, those who do not have much. 
This is a lesson in humility. Humility 101. <laughs> in fact, maybe I think it's advanced humility. It's 404. How many of us see, like Lot, the immediate returns? We walk away. This is not an issue of a bad decision. It's an issue of letting go of a chip that seems to be doing so well, but it does not have a long-term sustainability. Moses walks away and he says, I would rather pick the chip of eternity. And, 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 and what happens by him moving away from the royalty chip to God's chip? By the time we get to Deuteronomy, Moses is being buried by God. When we get to Jude, Moses is being resurrected by Michael. When we get into the New Testament, Moses is at the Mount of Transfiguration. He does not have to cross the River Jordan to get to Canaan. He gets to Canaan via heaven. I like that. I like that. He doesn't have to cross. Others cross the River Jordan. But Moses had to go to heaven. Then from heaven, went down into Canaan. He actually set food on Canaan. He did. But from heaven, of course. So this is where you lay your treasures in heaven. The pharaohs perished. They did not make it. Joshua and Caleb, they are still here. But Moses is in heaven. Here's the challenge, my friends. As we go to our return on investment, what shall it profit you? What shall it profit you? To gain the whole world and fail to realize this profit. And above all, above all, Nothing is worth your soul. Even the entire world is a loss when there is no soul. It is a loss when there is no soul. And here's um, in conclusion what the Bible says to you and I. Number one, take not your skill, your time, your prayers, your money, if invested into the work of the Lord. It will guarantee, guarantee a closer walk with God. Notice what happened with Noah. Took his skill, invested in the Lord. Went into evangelism for the sake of the Lord. Called many unto salvation. Even though they refused, he still called his family. Look at Lord. Bad decision. And all that he remained with was his family. Family is worth much more. When we have done it all and said it all, the minimum, the minimum that we must walk away with is family. Salvation is complete when there is family. Make sure family is in that bracket. And then Abraham, a missionary who leaves his homeland to an unknown territory to share the good faith, the good news of salvation. And as he does so, he starts by reaching out to his nephew, caring about him, in spite of the bad decisions he makes, calls him back, calls him back. And of course, we can make bad decisions, but there's always a second chance. Jacob can become Israel, and the Lord's grace can find us where we have fallen, turn us around, and work with us. My dear friends, heaven is real, heaven is sure, and this is the dividend which is declared, the dividend, Paul will not have us ignorant. He says, when you invest, when you invest in heaven, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered the minds of men what the return on investment is when you invest in heaven. I hope and trust God has been with you and he has spoken to you this moment. In Jesus' name. May he continue to shepherd you until we meet again. Amen.